Welcome everybody to the final session of this Quantum Creators Symposium. Uh, before I, we get into the talks, I'd like to note that unfortunately, uh, Zara Kanian uh, was unable to attend. Uh, so we're just gonna have three speakers this session. Uh, and yeah, we'll jump right into it. So it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Chris Anderson. So Chris and I actually go way back uh, to our days on the softball team in the PME. Uh, and there he made several innovations, including tying the quality of the beer that we drank to our win-loss record, which was a really fantastic motivator. I, I assume he's done some good science also, since he's giving a talk here. But anyway, uh, Chris, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. So hopefully I'm unmuted here. Um, thanks, Alex, for the really kind introduction, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So I'll be speaking about work that sort of lies at the intersection of my graduate work, which, as Alex mentioned, was done here at the University of Chicago, and my new postdoctoral work at Stanford. Now, although there's two separate institutions, they're united by a theme of material and an application of quantum networks. And the material I'll be telling you about is silicon carbide, and this application, once again, is building a scalable quantum network. So the type of qubit that I'll be focusing on today are these defects in solids. And so many of you have probably heard about the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond, which is basically a defect in this host crystal. And that defect traps some electrons. Those electrons have both spin and optical structure that we can use to make a qubit. And this system has been used in really seminal results in quantum science, from nanoscale NMR to doing sort of quantum error correction and distributing remote entanglement, including some work by some of the, the Quantum Creator Prize uh, sort of organizers. Now, if there's one thing I want you to get from this talk, it's that this nitrogen vacancy center in diamond is not unique. Not only are there other qubits in diamond, there's also other spin qubits in different materials, where I'll be focusing on this material, silicon carbide, where we have a wide range of different defects that have spin that we can play with as a qubit, and what I'll be focusing on in particular are these vacancy-related impurities, including the dye vacancy, which is simply just a missing silicon atom next to a missing carbon atom in this lattice. So there's this question, you know, you have these different options for materials to host these spin qubits, why would you choose silicon carbide? So the first reason that it's available on the wafer scale. So here's a six-inch wafer of silicon carbide and a tiny chip of diamond, and these two samples cost about the same price. All while silicon carbide displays many of the amazing properties of diamond, so much so that it's used in fake diamond jewelry. You know, it's optically transparent, it's hard, it's thermally conductive. But in addition to being diamond, it has other functionalities. In particular, you can dope it. And that's why it's been found uh, in wide use in power electronics for things like inverters and Tesla cars, to components in 5G technologies, to LED light bulbs. It was actually the basis of the first LED light bulb in 1907. And there's this fun idea of sort of what other semiconductors can you use besides silicon? And there was this nice New York Times article. And part of the reason I think it's nice is because it actually features a photo of my hands holding a chip of silicon carbide, which will actually produce some of the data you'll see in the rest of this talk. But basically, there's this excitement about materials beyond silicon, including silicon carbide. And it also fits in this broader story about the CHIPS Act in the US about developing semiconductor fabrication techniques. And there's been multi-billion dollar fabrication facilities popping up around the US. And so I have to throw up this quote from the New York uh, governor, which as someone from Silicon Valley, I sort of hate, but as someone who loves silicon carbide, I sort of love. And basically the quote says, you know, Silicon Valley, yeah, it's overrated. We're gonna make a new silicon carbide valley. So there's a lot of excitement around this material, which is great. Now, of course, I'm not giving a power electronics talk here. I'm giving a quantum talk. So. The other advantage of silicon carbide is that we have these amazing spin qubits, which I'll tell you about, and we also have high quality integrated photonics, and so I'll motivate why that's important as well. And there's this interesting feedback that can also happen because of this classical technology innovation, where we've actually seen in the past five years that the material has gotten better and better, and so our qubits have actually gotten better and better as well. So there's sort of a classical improving quantum and so you can also think about closing the loop and having sort of quantum sensors improve your classical technologies as well. So this silicon carbide, right, it's half silicon, half carbon. It sits in this middle ground between the amazing classical workhorse of the field, silicon, and the sort of traditional quantum workhorse of diamond, where we have both 
CMOS compatibility and wafer scale electronics, and these long-lived qubits that we can play with. So if I want to focus, in, I'm not going to focus in on the specific qubit that I'm going to be telling you about, which is this die vacancy once again, it's this defect in this host crystal. When I cool the system down to low temperatures, the optical structure resolves, and it looks a lot like a trapped atom in the solid state, where we have a long-lived spin ground state. In this case, it's a spin triplet, so there's three states. We use two of them as our qubit, and there's spin-selective optical structure that we can use to both read out, polarize, and also interface to scattered single photons that we can use for networking, which I'll describe later. We can use these features to optically polarize and read out our spin. We can manipulate that spin magnetically using microwaves, and we can see extremely high contrast Rabi oscillations with high gate fidelities. So we have good control of this single spin qubit. But of course, a single spin qubit is not enough. We want multi-qubits, we want multi-qubit registers. And so we can take our defect in the host crystal and we can use it to probe its surroundings, right? So we're in a material that has lots of silicon and carbon atoms around it. And some of those silicon and carbon atoms, they have a nuclear spin magnetic moment. And we can use that nuclear spin magnetic moment as a sort of auxiliary qubit. And the amazing thing about nuclear spins is they're basically one of the best qubits that we know of. They have lifetimes that can be as long as minutes, maybe hours, maybe days. So they're extremely robust. And we can couple to these nuclear magnetic moments through the hyperfine dipole-dipole interaction, just a sort of a magnetic interaction. And we can create entanglement between our central electron spin and these nuclear spins in the host crystal. But the thing that we love the most is the ability to interface to light. Because we have these spin-selective optical transitions, we can entangle the presence or the absence of a photon with whether or not our spin was up or our spin was down. And we're gonna use this a lot uh, later in the talk. And in particular, what we can think about is how do you entangle or how do you couple two spins together, two electron spins? For us, this is actually an extremely hard problem. And the way that we get around this is by basically using this interface to light to mediate interactions. So instead of the electrons talking directly to each other, we have the electrons emit light, and then we interfere that light on a beam splitter. And if these light uh, two single photons are indistinguishable, certain clicks on these detectors can create an overall entanglement between these two spatially separated qubits. So we can mediate interactions using light. So we have this amazing sort of platform where we have these nice spin qubits, this interface to light, these local sort of multi-qubit registers, and we can think about building scalable quantum communications nodes, which is what really excites me where we can mediate entanglement at distances using photons, and then we can store that entanglement in these long-lived registers. And this is extremely important when we think about building things like a quantum internet, where we want to distribute entanglement over large distances and store it for long amounts of time. For making everything like distributed sensors, to ultra-secure communications, to modular quantum computation of linking quantum computers together using light. And we can also study fun physics along the way. So as many of you know, the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, this year was about, basically about the same idea of distributing entangled photons and measuring non-local correlations. So we think about probing sort of interesting physics as well with a networked internet. So you might say, Chris, that sounds you know, all really great. Uh, so where is it? Where is my quantum internet? You said I have everything, it's amazing. So I would say we have a lot of the check marks of our list. We have good quantum control, we have these registers, we have this near telecom spin photon interface. Something unfortunately I won't have time to tell you about is we also demonstrated a single shot readout of our quantum state and the, what we think is the longest electron spin coherence in a solid of over five seconds. So they're extremely good qubits. But the problem is this idea that I told you about of trying to mediate interactions using light. And if you think about like a light bulb or an atom in free space, it radiates every which direction. And that's a problem when you want to use the radiated light to mediate interactions. You know, I want to send the photon to the thing I want to couple to, I don't want it to go over and hit a wall. I want it to all to be sort of channeled into the interaction I want to make strong. The good thing is we can get around this by creating a photonic cavity. And what that photonic cavity does is it creates something called a Purcell effect where it modifies the density of states that this atom can emit to, causing it to preferentially emit into a single spectral mode and a single spatial mode. And that's exactly what we want to mediate in efficient interactions between spatially separated qubits. And the important piece of the puzzle here 
is that this Purcell effect is proportional to Q over V, which is to say that we want extremely high quality factor photonics and we want them to be small. And that's what we've been focusing on at, at Stanford. So we want to make small, high quality silicon carbide photonic devices. And it turns out that to make any integrated photonics platform, there's basically one thing you need. And that's a thin film of a high quality material on a low index material, or in sort of traditional photonics, on oxide, which is glass, which is a low refractive index material. Once I have a thin film, I can make something like this, where I pattern sort of a photonic wire that's surrounded on all sides by a lower index of refraction material, such that light gets totally internally reflected inside of this wire and doesn't escape. So we can confine light at the nanoscale and pattern it and create devices. And it's all based on making these thin films and patterning it. And there's a few ways that one can think about making thin films of silicon carbide to make photonics. And what we've been doing at Stanford is something very, very simple. We simply take a carrier wafer that has this glass on it, and we bond a quantum grade high quality silicon carbide chip on top. And then we simply like mechanically grind or basically sandpaper away like 99.9% .9 of what we started with. And what we're left with is a thin film that we can use to make devices. We can pattern those thin films to make optical resonators on a chip at the nanoscale. So these are little ring resonators. So it's a photonic wire loop back around itself. It sort of confines light, sort of passes around this ring multiple, multiple times. In fact, the quality factor is five million, which means it basically goes around the ring five million times. That's the finesse, I guess. But the important feature here is that the quality factors are very high. We can make lots of devices on a chip. It's sort of solid state. The losses are low. The fabrication is quite easy. We have low sidewall roughness for those fabrication experts in the audience. So silicon carbide is an easy material to fabricate. We can make high quality factor photonics out of it. And this fits into a sort of broader emergence of silicon carbide as an integrated photonics material, which is very exciting over the past 10 years or so, where quality factors have sort of boosted up through the roof. We have wafer scale thin films to make photonics out of. And our, uh, we've also been exploring other things besides quantum. I sort of motivated quantum, but photonics are useful for, for more than just quantum applications. In particular, because silicon carbide has a nonlinear refractive index, if you pump it really hard, it can make these frequency combs, which is really useful for metrology and things like LIDAR and like you know, self-driving cars. So there's classical and quantum applications based on this high quality factor thin film technology to make nice photonic devices. So now we're gonna bring these two worlds together, right? We have high quality thin film photonics. We have these nice spin defects. Let's bring them together. So what we're gonna have is a micro disc resonator. Um, some of you might recognize it as a whispering gallery mode resonator. Basically light is gonna bounce around the circumference of this disc and be tightly confined and have a high quality factor. We're gonna to couple to this disc using this waveguide that comes really, really close to the edge and couples light in and out of this disc. So the light bounces around the disc and we sort of couple in and out to that disc through this wire. And then we couple to this waveguide, this wire, by basically having a free space laser and focusing on this facet of the device. So we can couple light in and out of this high quality factor optical resonator using this thin film technology. And then we can go and we can add our qubits. So what we do is we irradiate the sample with electrons, we create defects. And it turns out that we can have multiple defects coupled to the same optical mode. And having them both coupled is important, but potentially what's even more important is that they maintain their high optical coherence. So a problem in the field actually is that when you integrate qubits into nanostructured environments, they degrade. And in our experiment, we saw that basically there was some degradation, but it wasn't so bad. It actually turned out to be better than we, we expected, basically. So we have coherent uh, optical emission, multi-qubits in a single resonator. And remember, the whole point of this was to get basically a high amount of guided coherent photons to do networking or distributed quantum computing, for example. And that's exactly what we observe in experiment. We have high efficiency coupling to this device, and we have lots of coherent single photons that we're collecting. For those experts in the audience, we're also sort of approaching strong light matter coupling in this device where the single photon cooperativity is approaching one. And that's evidenced by this super radiant peak here, 
which is basically saying that both of these emitters are emitting at the same frequency at the same time. And uh, those photons coalesce at the output port of this essentially beam splitter, and we can see that sort of interference of single photons from these spatially separated qubits uh, in the, in the uh, probability coincidences on this uh, detector here. And the important piece about that is that's the first step towards building entanglement. We basically already have those two photons acting coherently by confining them in this shared optical resonator. And so if we combine that with spin control, we can actually mediate a entanglement between these spatially separated spins on this single photonic chip. So not only can we make on-chip entanglement mediated by light, but we can also do this thing I originally mentioned, which is networking at long distances. So photons can both make interactions at sort of arbitrary distances, but also can do things on chip, which is quite exciting. So now if we go back to our list, you know, we've, now I think we have basically all the check marks. We have this single spin inside of photonics, they're coherent, and the quality factors are high and they're scalable. And so the point here I think is that we basically have all the major milestones achieved, which is what really excites me, for scaling silicon carbide as a quantum network platform. So sort of to reiterate, we have this amazing material silicon carbide. So I said at the beginning, the only thing I wanted you to get away was that there was other things besides diamond. And now I'm adding to that to say that you should remember silicon carbide's amazing. We have amazing coherent single spin qubits, nice interfaces to light, local multi-qubit registers, and these high quality factor photonics for making wafer scale quantum devices that leverage the same technology that goes into an electric car, for making scalable quantum communications nodes, and maybe even to think about doing photonic integrated circuits on a chip that have sort of basically analogs to maybe boson sampling or photonic quantum computing, but using silicon carbide instead of maybe silicon. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Once again, this work was sort of a weird blend of work that was done here at the University of Chicago and also work that's been done at Stanford in, uh, in Yelena Vukovic's group where the photonic devices were really led by Daniil Lukin, who's an amazing grad student in our group. And we've also had sort of varied theoretical support throughout our time here uh, in understanding these qubits from Julia, who's also here at the PME. And so I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for your attention. Okay, so I think we have time for a few questions from the audience. Um, do you plan to have more than two qubits and do cat states on the disk resonator? Yeah, that's a really uh, exciting direction. Basically, now that we have two, we're most interested in scaling beyond two qubits and then making either sort of cluster states of light or entangling multiple qubits on a single photonic chip, making like a cat state or something or a GHC state. So that's the direction that we're going. So now it's about we have the, you know, the fundamentals are in place. So now it's about sort of exploring larger quantum states, um, which is definitely where we're going next. Is this on? Yeah. Well, thank you for a lovely talk. I, I noticed that you had silicon 29 and carbon 13 on there a bit. So are you using commercial silicon carbide wafers and then growing ep uh, isotopically purified epi on top? So this is a great question. So most of what I showed you was all natural, which is great. Um, but this five second number of the extremely long coherence um, and our ability to make really, really good nuclear spin registers relies on isotopic purification. And there we can grow it epitaxially with our collaborators in Sweden, but it's a little bit different than the like wafer we just get from the supplier that makes Tesla chips. Um, so that gap maybe still needs to be bridged, but we have so sources to do isotopic purified. Okay, I would suggest there is a cost implication there. And yeah. I also wanted to mention silicon carbide was pretty small when I was a young guy too. <laughs> so things, well, I'm, things it's can It's great change. that you can see anyway. it uh, grow, yeah. I mean, when you're growing thin films epitaxially, the cost is not so bad for isotopic growth, in my opinion. I mean, of course, it's more than natural, but. Gotcha. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, you mentioned that, in your opinion, we have um, all, or if not most, the, the factors for a scalable quantum internet, uh, quantum network. As I understand, a big part of that is also being able to transfer uh, quantum state information from different processors. And mm. I don't think that that's addressed at all or added as a list. Uh, could you please so, clarify? No, no, that, that's exactly right. So um, these spin qubits, they're amazing for distributing entanglement across a network. But when it comes to building a computer, they're lacking. And particularly what you would want to do is maybe network superconducting quantum processors over a network. 
So there's this final step of converting the photons into a microwave state that can go into a DIL fridge. And that's sort of a whole separate area of research. So I would say, yes, it's an important problem. This does not solve it. The thing that I like to say is this makes the network backbone. It doesn't make the links to the computers. It's maybe not a great computer by itself. But if you're going to make a scalable sort of telecommunications backbone for making a quantum internet, that's what we're really looking for for this, uh, for this system. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you just comment on the, the inhomogeneity and uh, spectral diffusion in silicon carbide compared to defects in diamond? Is it better? Is it worse? So this is, uh, this is the pro question. I think um, and people like Alex and others, they really love certain defects in diamond because they have these very narrow optical lines. And our defects in silicon carbide, they are not as good as the defects in diamond in terms of this but they are much better than, let's say, the envy center in diamond. And so we're basically within a factor of three of the lifetime limit, which is not perfect, but it's actually like much, much better than previous demonstrations. And we think actually there's pathways for improving that by controlling surfaces better and also by controlling the charge environment better. So uh, it, we haven't solved it yet, but it's actually much better than we expected. And partly I think that's because the wavelengths are longer. So actually what that means is that the surfaces are further away. It's sort of like a unsung hero for this platform is when you have visible photonics, everything's hard to fabricate, it's tiny, small wavelength. But when you start going towards telecom, things are a little bit bigger, surfaces are a little bit further away. That means your coherences are better too. Okay, well let's uh, thank Chris for his talk. All right, and uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Iwi Keck, uh, co or Quek, sorry, coming to us from uh, the Free University of Berlin. I'm not even gonna try and pronounce that in German. Maybe, maybe Hannes could pronounce it. <laughs> we're good, okay. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to your talk, thank you. Oh, okay, so hi everyone, my name is Ihui. Um, in fact, I have just moved from the Free University of Berlin to Harvard. Um, so today I'm going to talk about my research on quantum learning theory, and not just any old kind of quantum learning theory. It's quantum learning theory that has to do with learning with noisy or rare inputs. So um, let's just first define what quantum learning is. So as an abstraction, I would say that quantum learning is a term that you can use for any situation that involves an unknown quantum object, which you are allowed to probe. So we can, well, I guess computer scientists always like to think of unknown objects as black boxes because you can't really see them except for very specially designed probes. So what you do in such a situation is you send in probes to the, to the black box and the black box returns you some, some kind of answer to your probes. And then you pass these probes into an algorithm which does some kind of processing on the answers and then returns a representation of the unknown object. And just to be more concrete, um, examples of the unknown quantum object could be a quantum circuit, a quantum channel, some kind of Hamiltonians, perhaps um, encoding some problem of interest for those of you who are familiar with the quantum machine learning world. Uh, an example of a probe could be something like a measurement in some basis um, or some, for, some way to choose um, states which you set into the black box uh, and you collect their output. Or, the measurement could also be just collecting Gibbs states of, of the Hamiltonian of interest inside the black box. Now, what about this algorithm? So this kind of situation models things like variational quantum algorithms when you're trying to prepare the ground state of some Hamiltonian of interest. Um, tomography, shadow tomography, which is like um, a form of tomography where you don't actually need to return a guess of the full quantum state, but only um, a guess of like, a guess that predicts some properties of the quantum state, or it could also model situations like state discrimination when you have um, a, an unknown quantum state chosen from one of a few possible options and your job is to figure out which of the possible options it is. Uh, so I work specifically on the theory of quantum learning and that means that I ask questions like, how many probes do you need or what is the computational complexity of the algorithm that you need? And indeed, what quantum objects can you even put inside the black box in such a way that it would be learnable using uh, current technology? And I'm going to answer some of these questions today. So 
I'm going to also make a pitch for why I study quantum learning theory and why you should too, or at least kind of try and approach your problems from the lens of quantum learning theory. So the first reason is that a quantum learning theory, I believe, models the scientific endeavor. So very approximately, I believe that science is about learning about nature. And for instance, you could be an experimentalist who is observing some signals from, um, some, from, something, from some unknown object, and you want to figure out what the unknown object is. You could be someone who, for instance, observes some signals from uh, gravitational waves, and you want to know what sort of gravitational wave produced th those signals. And the fact is that nature isn't classical, and this was famously enshrined in a quote by Richard Feynman. And today I'm going to argue that not only is nature not classical, it also behaves as a scrooge, which means that you have very little control over nature and you basically have to work with what you get. So the first um, work I'm going to talk about is a very recent paper that in fact appeared just one week ago. Uh, it's entitled Learning Quantum Processes Without Input Control and it's with this fantastic bunch of collaborators. So let's look at some kinds of natural quantum processes you might be interested to learn. You could, for instance, be shining some light on a thin film and then you want to know, based on the photons that you collect, the height profile of the, of the thin film. You could be someone who's imaging the universe. You could also be observing some particle in a trap, which is kind of like hovering in some magnetic field. And you want to learn, basically, um, the separation between the, um, the, ex the first excited state and the ground state of this particle, which, which is a function of the magnetic field. What's common about all, this, all these situations is that you actually have no control over the input to the process. And this is where our work departs from many previous works in the sense that we, want, we are concerned with the problem of learning a quantum process in this unique situation when you have no control over the inputs. And again, this is like um, when you're kind of trying to learn something from a scrooge, but not a, a, not a money scrooge, but an information scrooge. You don't get to tell the scrooge um, where you want to probe the unknown process. The scrooge chooses it for you. So um, in this particular setting that we consider, um, we consider a learner that receives as input um, information about the unknown process, which consists in input-output pairs. And in this case, the input pairs are classical. For instance, they could be some variable like temperature or magnetic field. And the output pairs are the output of the process at this particular temperature or this particular magnetic field. And critically, um, we don't actually get to choose the inputs to the process. The, the inputs are drawn from some distribution which we assume is known only to nature and which we have no control over. And so because of this, um, the, what we get to observe are uh, quantum states that are in general non-identical, and this is um, an assumption that uh, previous works uh, had. So previous works assumed that you could kind of like request many identical copies of the output of the quantum process, but we, we relax this assumption. So the goal is, of course, to learn the unknown quantum process. And our theorem, uh, which is in our paper, is that um, this, in this kind of learning setting, even with so little control over the process, you can learn. So um, for the connoisseurs amongst you, we outline a way to do empirical risk minimization. So when you have a list of m possibilities for what the unknown process could be, you can find a process that, uh, that approximately gives you, um, that approximately best fits your observations with this number of um, non-identical copies of the output of the process. So the, the second reason why you should study quantum learning theory is that it turns out that many quantum information protocols or quantum computing algorithms boil down to a learning problem if you really stare hard at them. And we're going to see two examples. The first is quantum generative models, and the second is error mitigation. So uh, on the first example, uh, this is with this bunch of collaborators from Berlin. Um, we were motivated to investigate uh, quantum generative models from the observation that there are more and more papers nowadays that talk about quantum board machines, and these papers have touted them as being very important and a potential source of quantum advantage in near-term quantum computers. So these are some of the papers that we've seen. So um, we're, going to, we're going to look at quantum board machines as a form of quantum generative model. Now, how many of you have heard about DALI? Could you please raise your hands? Yeah, so DALI is a kind of generative model. And what a generative model is, it's a model that looks at samples from some distribution and then generates more samples from that distribution. So 
just to be a little bit more formal about it, there's an unknown underlying probability distribution which you are allowed to sample from. And in this case, or in this case, the probability distribution is a probability distribution over collaborators on this paper. And what the learning algorithm does is it generates more examples from the same distribution that it saw. And of course, um, what we're interested in is in replicating the distribution that it saw as closely as possible. And recently, there has been this proposal for quantum circuit-borne machines, which are replacing the classical learning algorithm with a quantum learning algorithm, namely a quantum circuit. And there is some hope that if you do this, um, you might be able to get a quantum advantage because um, quantum circuits are more expressible. They, they can explore, they can express more concepts relative to classical circuits. So as I said just now, um, we're interested in whether this claim of quantum advantage is actually true because this claim was kind of only empirically demonstrated and um, there were no rigorous guarantees about it prior to our work. So we use tools from the field of distribution learning to answer this question of whether uh, quantum generative models or quantum born machines actually work. So in our setting, we are interested in when the, the unknown probability distribution is also generated by a local quantum circuit. Now, why do we make this assumption? Well, think of it as if we can show that a quantum, okay, think of it as we, can, we assume that this learner here is, could be quantum, or, and we're interested in trying to uh, show that this quantum learner could demonstrate an advantage over a classical learner. So to kind of um, select the easiest situation for when a quantum advantage might manifest, we also give the, um, this quantum learner the, the handicap that the unknown distribution that is learning is also a quantum distribution or a distribution output by quantum circuits. So when I say that a quantum circuit generates a probability distribution, this is with respect to a certain kind of measurement. And we fix the measurements to be in a computational basis. Uh, and, and the job of the, of the learner is to output more samples of this same probability distribution from which it saw samples, or alternatively, a full description of the probability distribution. So our question is, how hard is it to learn this probability distribution generated by the circuit? And as you might expect, the answer depends on what is our prior on the circuits, how many qubits do they have, and what is their depth? And what is the gate set as well? So um, I'm going to briefly talk about what we managed to prove. Um, so there are two notions of learning that we explored. The first notion of, of learning is to learn a full description of this probability distribution here. And in this case, we showed that uh, circuits con consisting of Clifford gates, which uh, are local Clifford gates, that means that they only um, uh, entangle at most two qubits, uh, are always easy to learn. Uh, on the other hand, Clifford circuits with one T-gate become hard to learn when the depth is linear in the number of qubits. So that is um, intriguing for a reason that I'm going to talk about later. But a second notion of learning that we explored was not learning a full description of the unknown probability distribution, but just sampling from it. And in this case, uh, we showed that uh, local quantum circuits are hard to learn starting from an even, even lower depth. So, an interesting consequence of theorem one is that it says something about this delicate balance between learnability versus similar, simulatability, which is how easy a quantum circuit is to classically simulate. And the, thing, the reason why um, this example or what we've proven is significant is because Clifford circuits are famous for being very easy to simulate, but T gates are famous for being hard to simulate. And the more T gates you have, or the more T gates you add into your Clifford circuit, the harder that Clifford circuit, or the harder that circuit becomes to simulate. However, um, what we showed in the previous slide was that while Clifford circuits are easy to learn always, Clifford circuits with just one T gate become hard to learn. And in this sense, there's a phase, we observe a phase transition between um, the learnability of Clifford circuits. So in, in the, sorry. Okay, so if you look at the above panel, when your circuit consists solely of Clifford gates, then it's both easy to learn and easy to simulate. However, if you just add one T gate into the mix, then um, while simulation is still easy because you only have one T gate, we showed that the learning then becomes hard. So we observe like kind of a phase transition in learnability. 
So finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about is another recent paper which talks about quantum error mitigation, and namely the limitations of quantum error mitigation. Now, what is quantum error mitigation? Well, it's been touted as um, something that we can achieve in the near term that's going to take us towards our dream of building a fault-tolerant quantum computer. Um, and the reason for this is that quantum error mitigation kind of gets rid of the noise in your circuits, but mostly with classical hardware and with, without intermediate ancilla qubits. So um, I'm going to just elaborate on that. So in a world with noiseless quantum computers, most quantum algorithms we know take the following form. You prepare an input state, you send it into a quantum circuit which runs your algorithm of interest, and then you measure that quantum circuit, which um, you can either do many measurements and get an expectation value of some observable of interest, or you can just do, um, like, uh, I guess, like isolated measurements to, to get samples from the circuit. Um, in the real world, however, we don't get a noiseless circuit. In fact, this circuit is going to be noisy. So the cir we model this as having a circuit where the layers are interspersed with some kind of noise. And we are interested in getting rid of this noise through mostly classical means. And this is where error mitigation comes in. So error mitigation uh, is, in general, an algorithm that takes multiple copies of the outputs of noisy circuits, does some kind of measurements, and then post-processes the results of the measurement in this classical algorithm here. And in doing so, the hope is that this classical algorithm here will get rid of the noise that affected the noisy circuit and output the noiseless expectation values or noiseless samples from the circuit. So our question is, how many times do we need to run this circuit? What is the value of m that we need in order to get um, appropriately denoised expectation values or, appropri or appropriately denoised samples? And the, if we could answer this question, this implies some uh, resource limitations for um, many near-term quantum algorithms. And in particular, our results um, imply resource limitations for variational ground state preparation and expectation value uh, estimation. So um, in order to answer this question, I'm going to give a very brief sketch of how learning comes in. So our strategy to answer this question is that we define a learning problem that can be solved by error mitigation. And then the second step is that we lower bound the sample complexity for this learning problem. We lower bound the number of times the learning algorithm needs to see the, the noisy state in order to um, output a noiseless expectation value. And the learning problem that we defined is called noisy state distinguishability, which is basically given an unknown state from a set of known options, and with, with the caveat that this unknown state was passed through a noisy channel, determine which state it was. And you can kind of get an intuition for why error mitigation might help you in solving this problem, because if you could error mitigate, then you could, uh, you could measure certain specially chosen observables, in, and we could get their noiseless expectation values on this unknown state. And once you do that, then you have a very good handle on what was the state that you initially got. And, and so the second step is to just um, lower bound the sample complexity for the learning problem, which we do with information theoretic tools. And we, the answer that we got to this question was that um, it's actually quite uh, alarming because it turns out that in the worst case, or in the worst, uh, in the worst case choice of circuit, you need exponential in both the circuit uh, width and circuit depth number of um, uh, number of times, or you need to run the noisy circuit like that number of times in order to um, do proper error mitigation. And this is um, exponentially tighter than all previous bounds at relevant circuit depths, which um, is log of the number of qubits um, because we're, we're primarily interested in the near-term regime. Okay, so the, the key idea here is that um, we construct very rapidly mixing quantum circuits um, that uh, kind of under, under noise, they rapidly converge to um, outputting the maximally mixed state. So I'm going to conclude by um, kind of reviewing what we went through. We studied the learnability of quantum processes in a setting that brought us maybe one step closer to what experimentalists actually deal with. We studied the learnability of quantum circuits um, inspired by the setting of generative modeling. And also, we tried to we saw how we could learn noisy st noiseless states given a noisy state, and this was useful in helping us draw conclusions about error mitigation. So um, this 
uh, this work has inspired several follow-up questions. Um, the first is that our, our algorithm for for point A is only sample efficient and not computationally efficient. But of course, if you want to, to use an algorithm in practice, it has to be both sample efficient and computationally efficient. So now we're interested in kind of like going for a, a computationally efficient algorithm for learning. And something that could help is that maybe you have a prior on the kind of process that you want to learn. In that case, could you learn an unknown process in this setting of no input control in a way that um, doesn't require a lot of computational resources? I don't know, but I would really like to. Um, the second thing is that um, many of these results that we talked about are worst case results, which means that they are um, for kind of adversarial situations where you assume that the problem instance that you were given was designed to be optimally confusing and optimally bad for you. Of course, in a real life situation, um, nature, despite being a scrooge, is not really going to give you like the most confounding problem instance. So it would be interesting to study average case versions of these problem settings where you assume that your problem instance is just drawn from uh, some distribution uh, and see, what, see whether you can do better or even circumvent our no-go results for an average case setting. And, and then the very last question is that this is also a connoisseur question, which is um, specific to point, number, point C, which is that in order to prove our results for error mitigation, we had to construct very rapidly mixing quantum circuits, which are also highly entangling. And the question here is, how does the entanglement generated in a circuit affect its noise sensitivity? And I, I'm particularly interested in circuits that are used for near-term computational tasks. So um, with that, I conclude my presentation, and I open the floor for questions. Thank you. All right, so thank you for the excellent talk. I think we have time for a few questions. While we're waiting, I, I must say, I really enjoy your uh, Scrooge-based theory of quantum information. I would also point out he's capable of diving headfirst into a pool full of solid gold and emerging the other side, so there's huh. some tunneling happening too. So I see. <laughs> But anyway, on to the question. So. Okay, yeah. First, very nice results. And uh, Thank you. I'm here. Yeah. So, so I have a question about this error mitigation. And uh, you, you, uh, in your scaling, it's e to the nd. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there anything depending on how big the error is? Oh, yes, actually. Um, so I, it, this is kind of hidden in the big O notation. So um, the, the base of the exponent is actually related to the like, for example, it's related to the noise model that we use. So, for example, in depolarizing noise, the base of the exponent is related to the probability of depolarizing. Uh -huh. Yeah, because I think for the IBM device, when they say this probabilistic error, uh, error mm -hmm. cancellation, mm -hmm. I think their epsilon is actually very small, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Percentage level. So they can actually push to a pretty big circuit mm -hmm. and still get something interesting uh, with a reasonable overhead, at least in the near term. Yes. So uh, That's also very important to note. Yeah. Uh, but, but I agree with the scaling that overall it will become exponential mm -hmm. or longer term. Yeah. Okay, thanks for clarification. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello, and thank you for the talk. So in my question, you, you prepared lots of, I mean, you're looking at quantum processes prepared maybe independently, or those processes themselves might be not the same state being prepared every time. Mm -hmm. How do, do you, when you measure and try to learn these processes, do you need to apply global measurements to all of the states at once, or is it sufficient to just apply independent measurements to each qubit or state as they come in? Yes, this is an excellent, excellent question. So on my last slide, I said that our theory of pro quantum process learning does, is not computationally efficient, and it's precisely for the reason that you mentioned. It's because the measurements that we use are measurements that are kind of inspired by the work of Aronson, uh, shadow tomography, and these measurements are highly entangling. So definitely, we, um, we haven't been able to do this with measurements on individual copies, but that's something that I would like to investigate next. Okay, well, thank you for the presentation. We'll move on. We will move on to our final uh, presentation of the symposium. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Colin uh, Lualdi coming to us from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, so we're excited for your presentation. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Wow, it is a huge honor to be here with you today and sharing my research. 
And before I go ahead with my talk today, I just want to mention how amazing it's been to see all the presentations throughout the day, all the different topics and different areas of study. And it's so great for me to see, though, that underlying connectedness of our field and that foundation and being here in the quantum field and to see everybody and what they're doing. It's great. So today I'll be discussing photonic entanglement, specifically its efficient preparation and effective utilization. All of you are here today, which means you are already familiar with quantum entanglement, having a variety of critical applications such as quantum networking, metrology, and even Nobel Prize generation, <laughs> right? <laughs> But we can ask ourselves, if entanglement is so useful, then why is it, isn't it more widespread today? So I will attempt to answer that question. I think it boils down to two reasons, one of which is efficient preparation. With today's current technology, it is extremely difficult to both generate entanglement and detect entanglement on a large scale. To visualize this deficit, we can look at the annual global data consumption of 2022, which is projected to be 10 to the 24 bits. If we compare that with the state-of-the-art source for entangled photon pair generation that we currently have and run that source for a year, it will only generate 10 to the 16 qubits. So we have a deficit there. And in terms of effective utilization, which I believe is the second reason entanglement isn't more widespread today, at the moment with current technology, we don't have immediate killer applications. To provide an analogy of where we're at, if you consider the right flyer, its level of performance limits its applications. Compare that to the Boeing 747, which can not only fly, but it also performs at a level that offers many applications. We can see that we're still at the right flyer's level of performance. So today I'll be discussing how the Quiet Group is addressing these two challenges with the goal of supporting a wider deployment of entanglement-based technologies. We can start with the efficient preparation of photonic entanglement. Our group focuses on the single photon level. Single photons can be stitched together to make exotic entangled states. Protocols for this have been experimentally demonstrated. Shown in the left figure, we have the heralded two photon entanglement gate where we have four single photons going into the system and outcome two photon entangled states with the heralding signal. This is useful for quantum networking and a variety of other applications. On the right, we have a more recent experiment where single photons are stitched together to make a multi-photon cluster state. This can be used for quantum networking, computing, and more. These types of experiments will benefit from having an efficient single photon source in order to generate entangled, entanglement resources on a large scale. So how do we generate single photons? One common approach is the heralded single photon source. The principle of operation is quite simple. First, we secure a photon pair source using, for example, spontaneous parametric down conversion or four-wave mixing. With this, we can make a photon pair and detect one of the two members of the pair in order to localize the second photon, which can be used for further applications. We have to drive this source at a low power because the harder you drive it, you increase your chances of making multi-pair events, which is undesirable because it causes your source to emit more than one photon at once. Overall, this approach is beneficial in that it can generate pure single photons at virtually any optical wavelength and bandwidth. However, it's inefficient. I'll elaborate on that, what I mean by that. Because of that multi-pair problem, many experiments out there who use this approach run their sources at a low power with roughly 1% efficiency. If we wanna use this source in order to generate a 15 photon state, you can run 15 of these sources at the same time at one gigahertz of a repetition rate, which means it will take you 32 trillion years before you successfully make one of those states. <laughs> we can do better than that. 
One solution is to add photon number resolution to our heralding detectors. This will allow us to monitor when we can make those multi-photon pair events and exclude them. This means that we can drive our source harder up to 25% efficiency, which is a limitation by thermal statistics. This photon number resolution will allow us to make one photon, one 15 photon state per second, which is a definite improvement, but we can still do better. <laughs> By including multiplexing, we can have n individual sources running all at the same time, and we can monitor these sources to see which of these sources has successfully made a photon, then secure that photon and route it to a common output using an optical switch. If we have enough sources, then your efficiency in principle can approach 100%. Of course, with almost 100% efficiency, your generation rate for 15 photon state will also approach one gigahertz. Our group has already implemented this multiplexing concept within our laboratory setup. We've demonstrated multiplexing 40 sources. This is in time, however, not in space. But the principle remains the same. Our source emits photons at 1590 nanometers at a repetition rate of 500 kilohertz in a single mode fiber with 67% efficiency. This is a world record as far as we know. The performance of our system can be improved by addressing some system inefficiencies. Our previous system used previous generation technology, which included 64% semiconductor detectors, which gave us poor photon number resolution, making it hard for us to exclude those multi-pair events. The multiplexing process requires we have a quantum buffer, which includes an optical switch. Previous generation optical switch technology was slow and we could only run the buffer at 500 kilohertz. If we plug in our system, to the two photon heralded entanglement gate that I discussed previously, we projected to achieve a detection rate for entanglement of 10 to the four per second. However, our fidelity would only be 55% because of those multi-pair events. We are making improvements on our system with current generation technology. This includes 95% efficient superconducting detectors with better photon number resolution. We are also replacing our switch and can now run our quantum buffer in five megahertz bursts. This allows us to be able to improve our detection rate by hopefully a factor of 10 and improve the photon's fidelity to 83%. We can still push these numbers up more by incorporating next generation technology. People are currently working on developing 99% efficient superconducting detectors with intrinsic photon number resolution. And we're also developing very fast optical fiber switch, which hopefully will allow us to run our system at 10 gigahertz. These types of technologies will enable us to have a detection rate of 10 to the nine per second with a fidelity of 99%. So that is where we're going, my friends. To shift to the effective utilization of photonic entanglement, currently with today's technology, it's difficult to find what immediate applications can offer that genuine quantum advantage. To give you an analogy, the first email was sent in 1971. At that moment, it did not have a useful application because telecommunications and microprocessors still needed to be developed. But that happened over time and we arrived at the iPhone, which obviously has many applications. In our case, we now have laboratory entanglement sources that can generate entanglement. However, their immediate applications are limited because we need to develop single photon sources, quantum networks, and et cetera, before we can implement something like a quantum internet. Developing optimized single photon sources is still a work in progress and deploying quantum networks will take time. So my question is how can we use entanglement effectively with current technology? We can consider metrology as a candidate. 
As we heard earlier today, classical optical interference is very useful for precision measurements with many applications ranging from gravitational wave detection to imaging technologies. The advantages include easily being able to get high resolution, however, it's susceptible to optical loss, background, and dispersion, which makes it ill-suited for probing losing materials in an optically unforgiving setting. So can quantum interference save the day? In our field, it is very well known that if you have two photons that are indistinguishable mixing on a 50-50 beam splitter, they will bunch together and the result is an interference effect that looks like this dip shown here. This interference effect is robust against optical loss, background, and dispersion. Unfortunately, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. If you want that nanometer resolution, you have to either use a very large bandwidth photons or have very long integration time. Fortunately, if we introduce frequency or color entanglement between the two interfering photons, it just so happens that you can have your cake and eat it too. This animation shows entanglement introduces a sinusoidal modulation to the interference dip. The further apart your two entangled colors are, the more fringes you will have. This improves your resolution without needing large bandwidth photons. We've already applied this in our experimental laboratory system with 177 terahertz detuning, which means our two entangled colors are 810 and 1550 nanometers. This plot at the top shows our fringes. We performed a Fisher information analysis shown on the plot below. This allows us to project what kind of resolution we can get with our system. It turns out that with 24,000 photon pairs detected every 10 seconds, we can achieve a resolution of 2.19 nanometers, which in time is 7.3 attoseconds. That is just barely below our theoretical best of 1.74 nanometers or 5.8 attoseconds. We can compare this to previous work the best frequency entangled system experiment until now had a detuning of five terahertz, which limited their resolution to 192 nanometers. A recent conventional two photon experiment needed 10 billion photons collected over hours to get that nanometer resolution. So it's great that we have high resolution, but we also have to highlight that we have a quantum advantage, specifically its loss tolerance. Our interferometer has two paths, one for each photon. If we have balanced losses on both sides for both the quantum and the classical case, the visibility looks like this. If we go ahead and introduce imbalanced loss with the neutral density filters, we notice that while the quantum fringes do not change, the classical fringes degrade. This shows the quantum advantage of this new approach. So what's next? We are looking at doing new metrological studies enabled by FAST loss tolerant measurements on the nanometer scale at the single photon level, which allows us to characterize lossy materials, observe time varying signals, and probe optically sensitive samples. In summary, what do we need to make entanglement based technologies more widespread? More efficient preparation, which we can do using multiplexing methods. Secondly, we need the effective utilization of entanglement given current technologies. And for that, a good candidate is entanglement-based metrology. With that, I'll wrap up to acknowledge all the contributions from the Quiet group members and to thank our sponsors and funders and thank you for your time. <laughs> All right, thank you for the illuminating talk. Uh, it was really wonderful. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. we have time for a few questions from the audience. Yeah. 
Uh, great. Yeah, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the quantum advantage in the visibility. So with the entangled photons, the visibility did not degrade. Is it maybe because you are you always have to detect two photons, or didn't I get this right? Yes, you are correct. So in the classic scenario or case, you have your photons in supposition. So there's two paths, right? If you have loss, then you're actually going to lose your interference effect and reduce your resolution. But in the quantum case with, with two photon, you have to have both photons show up for the interference effect to happen. So if you do have loss, then the interference isn't gonna happen, which means it reduces your rate. But if both photons show up, then you'll have perfected the invisibility. Doesn't matter if it takes them a year to show up though, or a second. So to be fair, I said that the quantum approach is an advantage because the loss tolerance, because it's loss tolerant. But also to add to that, yes, you do have loss. Your measurement rate will be decreased. So I guess that's the trade-off that we're getting with it, or the principle. If it's bright enough of a source, then you can compensate for that. Yeah, great, thank you very much. Yes. Hi, Colin, thanks for a very nice talk. That was very cool. Um, I have a question about the nonlinear crystals that you use, and if you ever notice long-term effects from, for example, crystal degradation, where the pump travels through the crystal, if you notice any sort of uh, effects like these in the nonlinear crystals you use and how you would deal with that sort of thing. Thanks. Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. So as I mentioned, if you want the 25% efficiency with no multiplexing, you need to run your source at a very powerful pump. And that, as you stated, causes some problems um, with the with burning. And so that will lead to degradation of performance. But this is where actually multiplexing comes in handy because instead of pushing all of your power in one crystal, now you can divide it over n different crystals. So it, each crystal then gets one less power source. And so the overall efficiency stays high. So it actually handles the damage better. Hope that helps, thank you. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to invite all of the symposium speakers to come up and we'll have a, a moderated uh, a panel discussion. Okay. I want to thank all the speakers again. It was a very wonderful set of talks that we just heard. And I want to start the discussion off on something that was on Colin's slide, and this was the phrase killer applications. So I'd like to hear your perspectives, if you could identify maybe one or two killer applications that, that at least inspire you or get you excited, and maybe let's focus on the, the scope of, of quantum networks. So, Chris, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I think I mentioned this a little bit in my talk, but I mean, um, I think Aaron said this earlier in the day, like for networking, photons are sort of the only natural choice. You know, they travel at the speed of light, 
there's no thermal occupation of photons at room temperature, you can put them into fibers. They're really amazing. And so for, for our systems that sort of couple to photons and have these long-lived memories, our killer app, which is what I mentioned, is really providing this backbone once again for a network. You know, we probably aren't gonna make the best computer. They're pretty good for sensors, but what excites me personally is providing something that's scalable, that has something called a quantum repeater that, that mitigates photon loss, uh, that's also scalable because it's a solid state thing that we can make lots of at scale. Um, so that's really the killer application that I get excited about for our system. Anyway. Um, so for me, I think the killer app for quantum computers is something that actually isn't so much in the public consciousness. It is something like um, simulating materials. However, that is not what I currently work on. I, I do think it's very interesting, but um, most of my research, um, because you asked what, what, what inspires me, most of my research is about exploring the potential of quantum computers for machine learning applications, especially because I work on learning theory. And I think the interesting question there is whether all these big claims that have been made in the literature about quantum machine learning, whether they're actually true under reasonable assumptions like the presence of noise in the circuit. Colin? Yeah, I think it's fine that we make entanglements, but can we make a lot of that? And how can we use it? Like you mentioned, there are some good applications for the quantum internet, right? That's why to me, I mean, I want that in my future and it's exciting to see that. So distributed quantum computing is something I'm very interested in. And the quantum computers that we have right now, but how many qubits do we actually, can you have in those? Maybe a few, a hundred, maybe a thousand? But then you're gonna max out with the hardware. But now you can use quantum networking to connect those computers. Now we're opening up a whole new ball game of potential. So that's what's exciting for me, and that's what I'm looking forward to in the killer applications. Mm -hmm. I find these responses very, very nice because uh, they're not tethered to one particular algorithm or one particular application, but they're actually, as, as Chris described it, as kind of this backbone approach. So it's more of a foundational perspective. And, and I appreciate that because one thing I think about is if what happens if we find out five, ten years from now that actually we have very good classical solutions to these problems. Or we're actually able to simulate efficiently many things that we now think are not efficiently simulatable on classical machines. So this is a, a more holistic attitude, I would say. Following up on, on this, uh, I, I, you know, when it comes to building the quantum internets, there were some challenges that were pointed out in Chris's talk and in Colin's talk. I, I, maybe if we could just hear your perspectives on, on, on what you think are the, the, the key challenges in, say, the next five to 10 years. Uh, you had a nice checklist, Chris. I, actually, I want to pinpoint you down a little bit on, on quantum repeaters, because uh, you, you mentioned that just now in your response. But is that, is that a check on your, on your list, or where are we? Yeah, I would say there's basically two outstanding problems. One is interfacing optical photons to the leading quantum computing platforms, whether that's an ion or a neutral atom or maybe a superconducting processor. And there's this whole field of doing quantum transduction between various frequencies that's extremely important and exciting to basically translate that, that network backbone to the real computers. But what you mentioned is that there's this extra problem where if you're actually trying to send a photon through an optical fiber, let's say from Stanford to Chicago, I think it turns out that you need to send like 10 to the 35 photons just to get one that makes it through the fiber that actually is transmitted without loss. And that's a huge problem when you're trying to send quantum states. And so building a quantum repeater is a way to mitigate this loss by basically breaking up that channel into lots of segments and storing entanglement to sort of buffer signals. And no one has really done this yet. So I would say, number one, transducers to quantum computers, and number two, a repeater that lets you overcome this problem of loss. And if we really have those two pieces, then we can sort of realize this grand vision. Colin, you wanna? Yeah, absolutely. To that? I completely agree with you, Chris. And I just wanted to add, too, that I think it's important that we actually have dialogue between the quantum field with 
our telecommunications industry. Now, in that industry then, we can have amplifiers. So maybe the loss won't be as big of a problem if we can have those amplifiers. So 90% efficiency would be great, and you can boost that up easily. But as Chris mentioned, you know, in the quantum situation, the loss is too great. So specifically, you're not able to clone the quantum devices. So in a quantum case, we have to preserve every fine item in the system. So we want 99.9999% of everything. But I think it's important that we, if we can have that collaboration between the science and the telecommunications industry and inform the development of the next generation technology, that's gonna allow us to build this kind of system that we want. Um, it's fantastic. I'd, I'd like to maybe uh, build on that question a little bit, even going outside of networking and into the general idea of quantum information. Uh, right now we're in this uh, so-called noisy intermediate, intermediate scale quantum regime where none of the equipment actually works that well. We're still trying to determine if any of it's gonna do anything useful in the next couple of years while we're continuing to you know, improve our equipment. Uh, so uh, Iwe, maybe from your perspective, uh, you know, what can we learn from the current state of the art of technology you know, before we make these further technological breakthroughs that'll give us error correction and things like that? Well, I think that the situation is not entirely hopeless. Um, as Abhinav mentioned, there have been demonstrations of uh, quantum advantage, although for tasks that, are, that don't have any practical um, applications. So I think that one major use of these um, NISC devices is to act as a test bed for like very simple um, problem instances of algorithms that we think can be run in, in the future. Um, and as far as I know, that hasn't really been the case yet. People have been um, proposing kind of algorithms that are more tailored to NISC devices. Um, but yeah, I think that not all hope is lost. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so I think it would be fantastic if we would take a question or two from the audience uh, for the panel. Maybe while you guys think of a question, uh, let, me, let me ask one here. So this is a methodology question um, that kind of maybe unites all the talks here. So in, in Iwe's talk, she presented the framework as this black box scenario where trying to learn something about this, this black box by, by probing it with questions. And, and that hits home well with me because that's the way that I think about problems as well. Now, I don't think that most experimentalists view it that way because they don't have a black box in their laboratory. In fact, they've built something that, that they believe have high confidence in as far as its characterization. And so I'm wondering if from an experimentalist, if, if there is this a, a value in sort of these black box approaches that is commonly taken. And, and also, uh, Iwe, from the, the theory side, if, if you are interested also in, in I mean, opening up the box and and looking at specific models. And I know you gave some examples there, but I just would like to kind of hear this interplay between the two different methodologies. I think this is an excellent question. I think something I've been trying to do in the past few years is to steer all this theoretical research in a direction that kind of interfaces more with what experimentalists actually see in the lab. Um, so the, the learning um, processes without input control, that was an example of that. But I think it's also true that if you have some prior on what is inside the black box, you could potentially do a lot better in not only um, learning applications, but also other kinds of quantum algorithms. Um, so I'm curious to know uh, what sort of priors experimentalists have on what you put inside the black box. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, I think at some level you need some small black boxes and you need to like rely on existing things that you can just use without thinking about it too much. And that's what has really enabled a lot of the advances. We don't have to think about you know, the microwave sources or the lasers or anything. Those are black boxes to us when they were parts of research you know, in the 1970s. And so I think you see a lot of companies making basically their quantum computer a black box that people utilize. And I think there's some evolution of that in the sciences as well. 
And I think basically as long as you have people tackling the problem at all levels, it's, it's fine. You have the people developing the black box and what's inside, and then you have the people that use the black box and do something different with it. So personally, I like what's inside the black box, but I also want to work with people who care maybe not so much about what's inside, but what you can use it for. So basically my answer is I think there's uh, levels to do this at. And I think this is ex exactly the, the philosophy espoused by shadow tomography, where like you don't care about characterizing fully what's inside the black box, but kind of like um, characterizing only in a very practical sense what's inside the black box, what it can be used for. So that's very nice to hear that this is actually <laughs> something that's not totally irrelevant to experiments. Yeah, and I'd like to add too, you know, as an experimentalist, the black box, we have an advantage because it actually helps us understand what's ideal. You know, what is our ultimate goal that we want to arrive? And we can ignore kind of the nuts and bolts of it, and it helps the experimentalist then figure out what type of work is important in our effort. So for example, multiplexing and what we're doing, the black box, you know, we can take it or close to 100% efficiency. And so that's important work that we decided to do. But the physics is limited. Below 100%, it's, um, then it wouldn't be, But if I notice that we have a physical limitation, then we know how to approach it. But then we know it's not the best approach either. So we have to look at those limitations. The black box does help us then understand and see those limitations. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I guess I have one more thing to add. I mean, maybe this is like a hardware engineer's uh, sort of aspect, you know, uh, context, but Somehow I view like creating the black boxes as the job of industry. Like if you go in a lab, it's not a black box. It's wires everywhere, you know, it's lasers, there's a cardboard box in the corner. And so you sort of need someone to really highly engineer it such that you can use it as a black box. Hmm. And I think, you know, us academics, so people in, in, in labs, like we develop the technology such that someone can develop a black box that other people can use, but we don't want to be the black box suppliers because somehow we need to engineer it a little bit better for it to be utilizable. So we've heard in the talks about you know some of the advances in, in uh, quantum technologies that we need to make these quantum networks happen. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the enabling classical photonics technologies that you think are uh, critical to making this happen? Yeah, so I guess for me, like it's always like where do you draw the line? Like these superconducting nanowire detectors, they're amazing. They're superconductors, but are they quantum? You know, so it's like, where do you draw the line? But like better detectors, that's probably not so quantum. It's very critical. It turns out that everyone basically in the field of quantum optics and people working with lasers, they always complain about their laser. So like better lasers is always a good thing. Um, and I think, you know, at least for me being a solid state person, better materials and better fabrication is always necessary. And so that's how we work with people in electrical engineering, material science. And so, um, you know, it's all interrelated. You know, it's not just quantum people off in an island. It really connects heavily to people in industry building new technologies and also people in other departments developing new techniques and materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even to add to that, also how quantums is so interdisciplinary. That means that we actually have to use so many different kinds of technologies in different areas and build them together. And you know, I completely agree with you, Chris. It's our role as quantum scientists is to understand the quantum physics, but we also have to look at what available technologies are there and figure out how to integrate that all into our work and develop a quantum system. Good. Okay, all well, right. Let's thank our speakers again. <laughs> and uh, before we depart, we'd like to give out the certificates. Uh, we can just wait <laughs> one moment. So, so thank you again, Chris, uh, and congratulations on winning this award. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> thank you, Yue. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> 
Colin, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thank you everyone who, who uh, spent the last two days with us. As we conclude the uh, 2022 Chicago Quantum Summit, we wanna make sure to thank a lot of people who made the event a success. One, of course, the speakers coming from industry and academia um, and government. Um, the Chicago Quantum Exchange team, uh, including David Shimomura, Russell Ceballos, Megan Rouse, Meredith Four, Mary Pat McCullough, and that other David, David Ashlam. Um, I also really quickly want to thank Anthony and the Plus One team and you Chicago Creative in the back who managed to make all the AV work really seamlessly. Um, and then, you know, the whole Chicago Quantum Exchange community from uh, all of our universities and national labs and, and company partners and other partners. Really, this, this event would not go on uh, with, without you guys. Um, and thank you also to the more than 500 participants who were here in person and last night at the public event and joined virtually. Um, and I think with that, let's give one last uh, robust round of applause to the 2022 Quantum Creators uh, awardees who are really on the cutting edge and defining uh, the field of quantum information science and engineering.